here's so one of the things that is oftentimes the one of the most depressing parts or can be one of the most depressing parts of our classes when we're talking about the state of our fisheries, right? That that we're we're having problems and all this and that and and we've talked about cereal depletion and all this all this and that. The other thing we just see is this is general degradation of this particular renewable, which should be a renewable resource, which is, and we see this all over the place in Asia and Europe and Atlantic and Pacific and everywhere, um, starting off with a high level of individuals. And recall, when we talk about ecological groups, we usually say population. When we're talking about an exploited species, we usually talk about stock, but stock is you know, refers to a population, the number of individuals. Also recall that usually when we talk about fisheries, we talk about biomass. So we talk about landings, meaning the amount of material that makes it to the dock, that makes it to where we offload our vessels catch. Um, and so uh, we don't necessarily talk about the number of individual crabs or individual fish. We talk about the tonnage of fish, uh, for example. Regardless, the amount, however we, however we measure it, starts off for the most part really high, and then over time, uh, it, might, it might start at some level, might get a little bit higher for a bit, but then it basically degrades and it declines, right? Um, and so we can either say like everything's over, blah, 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 or that there's like, you know, one big answer. Um, the reality is uh, uh, we, we, these methods that we've talked about, things like limiting our effort, limiting our fishing effort, things like establishing protected areas to allow reproduction to happen and, 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 and augmentation of the population from a, a protected area, all these things, they actually can work. So let's look at some examples of some of this. So this is a white sea bass. Um, does anybody fish for white sea bass? Besides Ryan? Ryan's our only white sea bass fisher. Uh, so again, this is when I was in when I was in graduate school. This was uh, you know like summers out of Catalina, like probably at least three of every th th you know three meals a week at least were probably white sea bass. This is a, a relatively large fish, very tasty, um, uh, uh, very common, uh, very popular uh, fish to harvest, and. Um, Let's, let's look at and see what's going on. So here's the, this is the metric tons, and this is the commercial catch. Now, not the recreational catch, but the commercial catch in California waters. Basically, uh, kind of up, down, up, down, up, down. And then we hit our post-World War II era, which is a common phenomenon. What did we get from World War II that impacted our fisheries? Technology, Technology primarily, right? So many more vessels, much improved... Uh, much, much more efficient things like winches and things of this nature, much more efficient engines. What else? Sonar. Yeah, technology to detect the critters as well. So sonar, eventually satellite technology, all this stuff radically helped us find critters. Well, I mean, first, like, get to where they were with the transportation, find them, decide on where to go, and then... Three, uh, when we did find them, be able to catch more of them and more efficiently, you know, bring those individuals uh, on board. Uh, so, um, yeah, okay. And so that what we see here, so post World War II, boom, look at all those white sea bass, and then basically declining catches since the late '50s, early '60s, uh, down, 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 and and to where we were uh, about 20 years ago. Um, so something happens right here at this, at this uh, red point. And then after that red point, check it out. Here's, here's what starts happening. So the, the landings begin to tick up. Any guesses as to what that was? Yes. Excellent. Excellent. So uh, we banned uh, uh, gill, gill. So these guys are um, a regular fish, right? They swim around. They move forward. And they have these opercula. They have these covers on their, gill, on their gills, right? So a gill net, I should have brought a net in to show you guys. I don't have one here. But, um, but basically how a gill net works is it's, it's a net. And they float. 
and uh, they can be hard to see. So the fish are float swimming, swim, 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 swim. And then all of a sudden there's something here. It looks like there's a hole in front of me, right? So I can start to swim through that hole, but ah, uh, it's not as big as I thought. And so I get stuck. So my, my nose, my head starts to get through, but unlike kelp or other objects, I can probably just swim through and push through and, and keep going, yeah? Now I start to go and then it, it, it's, a, it's a net, so it tightens around here and I can't get past the, the thicker part of my body. So I'm like, well, this sucks. So then I try to back up, but a fish, these fish are always breathing, right? So they're always kind of this little pulsing of our perculum, this little pulsing of our covers of our gills. And as I back up now, this gill, or excuse me, this, this um, uh, uh, net hooks on between, between this part of my skin and this part of my skin, and I get stuck. So my head is stuck in there. And I, now I'm screwed, and I ain't going anywhere. And then at some point, when the, when the net is pulled up, stuck in, embedded in that net are my fish. And so we, we banned uh, gill nets on the backside of Catalina and various places um, with this proposition, and that seemed to be the key thing. So uh, this is, uh, yeah, so I, I just showed you this. Um, but uh, this data is, and much of our data comes from the fishery. This comes from the fishery itself. How many tons did the, the fishing boats get? Yeah? Everybody with me? So any possible problems with that you guys can think of? Right. And so you, this is what you guys experienced when you played uh, fish base the other, uh, the other week, right? <laughs> so the only data you had was this, right? You're like, oh, I put my vessels out and I got fish back, right? And the natural assumption is that that is telling me about what the, what the population is like, right? It doesn't, and, and then our total catch, so this, this would be total catch. So what we're looking at here would be, would be Sebastian's vessels and Eddie's vessels and everybody's vessels together, right? The total catch. Um, but this doesn't tell me, uh, if, if, if all we're doing is, is the stuff that we did last time, if all it was was uh, the number of, of fish, that would be a little bit confusing, right? Because maybe you guys bought, maybe you guys ordered some more vessels and you put some more vessels in. Or maybe you moved your vessels to the offshore where last time you had them in the inshore or something of that nature, right? So when we do this, there's always a problem with this because we assume this is the population. The other thing is we have to control for effort, for effort. So we have to control for the number of vessels, the number of days at sea, whatever, whatever. You know, there's, there's various ways to do that. Number of hooks in the ocean, number of hours that the nets were in the water, whatever it is. Otherwise, we can get easily fooled even more. So there's many, many ways for us to get tricked by this landings data. And so this next stuff is fisheries independent return. So this is, these are some, this is some long-term monitoring data where uh, researchers have been going out and just sampling the white sea bass population, not through, um, not standing on the backs of vessels where people are hauling and stuff. And so this, we call this catch per unit effort, right? And so we've standardized it. So in this case, this is metric tons per vessel, but, but regardless, it's, it's a standard, it's, 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 some, it's some apples to apples comparison is the important thing here, right? And so what we see here is check it out. So here's when here's that era that that ban the uh, uh, gill net ban went into effect. And of course, instantly it's not going to change, right? Because the little individuals have to become slightly bigger individuals, which have to become reproductive age individuals, that have to re you know all that kind of stuff. So there, there's always a lag with biological populations to some extent. But after we go a few years out, check it out. The catch per unit effort is going up. So that's an indicator that with the given level of effort, we're, we're, achieve, we're, we're landing more individuals, more tonnage of fish. So that's a positive sign. So this is, this, is not, this is no longer a fishery in decline. This is a fishery that's either doing well or at least recovering. Cool? Um, and we've seen that continue on and continue on and continue on. Um, and we see that both in the recreational fisheries catches and 
in the commercial fishery fishing catches. And a few, oh yeah, Ryan. Ah. Right. So I, I started our, our previous hope saying that, hey, there's a lot of benefit or a lot of potential upsides from aquaculture, mariculture, right? Um, and so we have had, run by Hub SeaWorld, we have had a white sea bass uh, culturing and, and deployment um, uh, program for about the same period of time actually started before the gillnet ban. And so our colleagues at Hub SeaWorld would tell you that it's worked great, because look, you know, look, right? Hey, the, the rearing of white sea bass in tanks in basically northern Orange County, and then taking them to different pens around the state at Catalina and elsewhere to go from little tiny babies to larger juvenile individuals, and then release those individuals, um, they would tell you that it's working great, and it's really awesome. Uh, the, I would say the jury's out, and it's unclear how much of an impact that particular marine stocking effort has had. So they clearly are doing it. We're spending a lot of money. We're, we're making a lot of fish. But as for how many of those fish are entering the populate. And so what we do is we tag a subset of those individuals. And then when the fishermen uh, catch those individuals, they can get a, a cash reward by, by turning in the tag. And, and they say you know, where they caught it and the size, basically. And then they just tell us the number. And so you, it's, a, it's a mark recapture type of an approach. Um, uh, I would just say it's unclear what effect that's had. It is clear that once we did the gillnet ban, that had a, we saw major shifts. And this was going on, and the white sea bass project was going on before the gillnet ban started. So we haven't seen a clear signal of it. Is it a horrible idea? Is it doing nothing? Can't exactly say that, but is it driving the recovery? Probably not driving the recovery. I think that's a, I think everyone would, would agree, agree on that. Good question, good question. Um, and so there's also positive signs. So I think there's maybe in the last few weeks or so, there's been a new, new record. But for a long time, this was the world record um, spearfished uh, a sea bass. And this is a 92 pound fish. That's a very big fish, right? And so that happened, I just note, after the gillnet ban. So we don't know for sure, but I think there's a high likelihood that if we had had that gillnet ban around, it would have been much less likely that this individual would have encountered this large fish and been able to, to <laughs> kill it, right? So, okay. So white sea bass, I would argue, are a conservation success story, are a fishery success story in California of a species still actively fished in a very popularly targeted uh, and exploited uh, wild population. Another example, uh, giant sea bass. So these are cool fish, and I think, I think I've told you guys the story, but the, when they're juvenile and they're babies, they're spotted, and the adults look nothing like the babies. Um, so the, these guys look like a school bus. So these adult uh, giant sea bass, um, they can be almost the size of the desk you guys are at. Maybe not quite that big, but just about the size of that table. Um, they're, they're huge. These were apex predators on our SoCal inshore reefs for thousands of years at least, right? This guy has a giant mouth. This guy is what's known as gape, his diet is what's known as gape limited. It means whatever the hell this guy could suck in, he would eat lobsters, other fish, crabs. I mean, whatever this guy could ingest, this was the top predator on our Southern California reefs. Um, it's a huge fish. It is a giant fish. Uh, <laughs> would it go after a human hand? Uh, I don't know if it would go after a human hand, uh, but it would. It ain't afraid of you. The big eye. That sounds like a 
So it's like a Colombo murder mystery. Yeah, they said, I was walking out and a big eye came in. Um, yeah, Ryan. These guys, these guys eat a whole. I mean, the, the, these guys like nobody. I mean, when they're when they're lit, when they're younger, of course, everybody you know, other you know, sharks and other things would attack these guys. But when they get to this size, ain't nothing. I mean, we didn't have anything that big. I, mean, I suppose if there was a, I don't know, a, a big starving. I mean, yeah, I, I, I can't. It's hard to imagine what would eat these guys, right? Um, uh, the first time I saw one of these guys, I was my my project, my PhD project was about algae recruitment, and I was putting all these these cement things all around the bottom of the ocean um, out at Catalina Island, and um, and uh, yeah, I just moved a lot of cement around. But basically, um, uh, what we would do is we'd jump off the boat and then we'd rock it to the bottom with these huge heavy weights on our hands and we land on the bottom and then it was they were too heavy to swim you could barely move them so then i built these handles and you go to the bottom you take off your fins and you would moonwalk over the bottom of the ocean to, to put them in the right place because it was too hard to move them any other way and so as you can imagine the bottom of the ocean is very rocky right so it's it's very difficult to walk over the bottom of the ocean so the whole time i would be looking down because otherwise i would trip there's like all these things to snag your feet and one time I was walking down, maybe where like Izzy and his uh, like over there, like about far away, and there, there's a kelp, you know, the start of the kelp reef, and I was on the rocky part, and I was looking down, and I looked up, and I was very, very scared because uh, I, I didn't know what it was, and it was this big, huge thing coming out of the of the kelp and the dark kelp with these big, huge eyes. And it's like, mock, mock, and, like, and I remember blowing all this air, and, and, um, and it, was a, it was a juvenile giant sea bass. So it wasn't even a full-grown adult. And this thing looked, I swear to God, it looked like a VW bug. It was, it was one of the <laughs> largest things I've seen. And after, after like, you know, half a second, I realized, oh, it's, it's cool. But it was scary when I, when I saw it out of the corner of my eye, and I thought, you know, I don't know, the boogeyman was coming to get me. But um, so they used to be really common. Again, here's the same old story, right? Here's commercial landings. Here's the number of these guys. Okay, so low, low. And then we figure out, oh, these are tasty. Everybody's like, oh, they're tasty. And we start harvesting them. And then, of course, like the pattern we've seen, we start on this long hill decline. There's a bit of a reprieve. And we actually see this in some of our species. There's actually a bit of a reprieve during World War II because people are out slaughtering other humans and not slaughtering the fish, right? So, so in some cases, we see populations um, uh, uh, do some amount of recovering during the, the period of, of World War II. Um, but then afterwards, we're back to the heavy exploitation pressure. Um, another example would be um, uh, some of our shark species. So th in this case, this is a soup fin shark. Um, these are our leopard sharks. Uh, leopard sharks are one of the species that um, they get, for those of us that went on the um, Dabble Canyon tour, this is one of the warm water species that will that will take up residence in and around the marina because the water temperature is so much warmer in the, in the plant discharge uh, uh, embayment. Um, uh, and so, uh, yeah, all the same thing, right? So we see these guys declining, you know, blah, 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 blah. So we had, we, we were harvesting these guys at this, th these levels and they go down and they go down. And again, after that gill net ban, giant sea bass, uh, soup fin sharks, leopard sharks, the catch per unit effort all goes up, right? So all of the so so this one this one management uh, decision to limit how we were exploiting, to limit our take, to limit our gear, to limit our harm. Sometimes that's enough. That's not always enough, but sometimes just eliminating that harm, if you have healthy enough populations, they can recover on their own, and that's what we're basically seeing with with these critters. As we've stopped to, to knock them down they are, and given them enough time, these are very long-lived individuals, right? So these guys are decades and decades old, right, at, at these big honking stages. So it takes decades to see the, these big signals, but, um, but they are um, recovering. 
Um, and then uh, these are um, uh, an another example of a fishery independent survey. Okay, so ones where we're doing divers in the water, not harvesting, just swimming around, writing down what we see for long-term monitoring. Again, the value of long-term data sets, just like our public opinion polling and our other, other stuff out at, at the islands and everything. So here we go. So these guys were actually um, uh, declared endangered, right? And so they're, and that was back in the early 80s. So the, the endangered species protections didn't do anything. That they kept declining, right? Kept declining, kept declining, kept declining. Um, it wasn't until we did the gill net closure that a few years later we started seeing individuals in Palos Verdes show up uh, just in our, in our background transects. And so we're seeing this more and more. There's a big effort right now underway across the state to try to do a better job of this. To, and, and this is a great example of citizen science. So because giant sea bass are something that are, you know, every, pretty much everybody, if you see one of these things, you'd, so you don't confuse it with a dolphin or something, right? Um, and so, the, you know, whereas other things, rockfish, you might need some, some knowledge to identify what species what. These guys are very conspicuous. And so there's an effort to, um, uh, a citizen science, if you see one of these individuals if you're out diving, if somebody's fishing and they pull in a, a fishing line, right, you can record this individual. And, um, and we thought we were going to have some good model data from that effort uh, right now, but it's, we need a little bit more time. But, but the point is, qualitatively, more and more of these individuals are showing up, which is a conservation success story, I would say. So all these guys are not fully recovered, but I would say these sharks, uh, white sea bass, all these guys are an example and are as evidence that even here in California, we can recover our fish species, we can recover these exploited stocks, we do know what to do. So even though we look at all these challenges in front of us, and yes, they're hard, yes, we need to make some, some tough calls and everything, but it's not as if we are in a total black box and don't know what to do. We have the power to influence these resources. Ryan. I was going to say, do they have a growth rate on the stocks you have? Because I know that, I mean, having some research, it's been assumed that they stay for a very long time to get that big. Um, and I feel like I've Right. Yeah. So, so Ryan's question is, is, is have, have our, have our giant sea bass populations recovered to both the numbers they were before, but also the demography, right? Are, are there enough of the big honking old ones um, that there used to be? And, and clearly not. We're, we're, the, the, um, the demographics are sort of a lot of teenagers and a lot of 20 somethings, right? But not a lot of 50 somethings uh, still. So, so I, that's why I say, I, I, I wouldn't say these are done, but they are all showing the right trends and, and are on track to, be, to recover.